Hello, 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 everyone, and welcome <laughs> to today's Zen Pilot webinar featuring Ryan Watson, partner at Upsource, and with our own very own Gray McKenzie, co-founder at Zen Pilot. Hello, everyone. Hope everybody's having a lovely time today. We're about to certainly and also to help you uh, learn more about your agency financial metrics. Just to let you know a little bit about the people on the call who you'll be listening to today. Not me primarily, I'm just here to facilitate, uh, but I'm Kuba, Content Marketing Manager at Zen Pilot. With us on the call, like I mentioned, is Gray McKenzie, our co-founder. I mean, this is a Zen Pilot webinar. A lot of you probably know Gray, big project management and agency operations brain, and he's the, the, the man behind uh, Zen Pilot alongside our co-founder, Andrew. But also with us on the call today, and what makes this a very special occasion, is Ryan Watson from Opsource. And Ryan, I thought I might give you, you know, a sentence or two to introduce yourself, if you don't mind. I don't mind at all, and I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so Ryan <laughs> Watson, I'm a partner at Upsource. Uh, we are an outsourced accounting and CFO advisory firm for agencies. Uh, we've been doing this for the better part of a decade, I think over 11 years um, and we can talk more about like the things that we do, but my background is, uh, I, before this role, I actually, uh, was COO, CFO of an agency. So I sat in the operator chair, sold that business. So I've got plenty of empathy for running an agency on both sides and excited to talk to your, uh, to your audience here. It's a cool topic. Okay, awesome. A little bit of webinar housekeeping before we begin. Uh, you are bound to have questions as we present the content. Please drop them in the Q&A, not in the chat. And regarding the chat, uh, don't worry if you're not seeing a lot of messages there. It's set up so that we will be getting your messages. So don't hesitate to drop your messages there. Let's start with what you're hoping to learn today. Kind of steer us in the direction of what you would like to learn the most about. If you've got some questions already on your mind, questions, drop them in the Q&A. Want to learn about something, uh, you, can, you can drop that in the chat. Just let us know you're there. You can see us and hear us and everything is coming to you okay. So that's the one thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, we'll be doing the Q&A. Unless there is a question that's like really relevant to what's being discussed right now on screen, we'll be doing the Q&A at the end of the presentation this time around. So um, pay attention to that. And yeah, I mean, the story so far behind this webinar is that last year in October, okay, uh, what happened was Ray was a guest of Ryan's on the Upsourced YouTube channel. You should go check that out. And we talked all about project management metrics for agencies. And today we're doing the switcheroo. So Gray will be grilling Ryan today on everything related to- Nobody told me about grilling. Fi Thank you. <laughs> uh, we got you here now. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So if anybody any, anybody here is a listener to the Agency Journey podcast, you know, Gray always comes with great questions. Uh, so that's what you can anticipate hearing about today. And I don't want to make the intro too, too long. So unless there's any other notes from y'all, then I guess I'll just pass it over to Gray, disappear into the chat, be answering your questions and dropping links and just enjoying the show. Yeah, yeah. good to go. Awesome. All right, take it away, Gray. Thanks, Kuba. Let's do it. I'm excited to dig into this, Ryan. Um, we've got uh, like some of the context here is we got a handful of shared clients and the work that we're doing on the project management side is deeply tied into what the financial operations of a firm winds up looking like. And you all, obviously the metrics that you're reporting on are going to be very indicative of how adept a firm is at managing projects. And like the core thing that we do is charging clients and delivering client work back to them. And we try to do that as profitably as we can. So um, <clears throat> I'd love to just dig into like kind of skimming lessons from the best of the best. Um, yeah. I think there's two different, the, the two different pieces are like, what should we be looking at? What are the actual metrics? And then what does yeah. good look like? So I know you've got a report put together, but let me let me toss it over to you, and let's just kind of start with yeah, what let's that looks yeah, like. let's do it. And 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 obviously, you know, we've we've gone back and forth, and so you know a little bit what I'm going to do, but just for everybody's benefit, like I, obviously, as you, you know, as we thought about and prepared for this particular, you know, this discussion around like what are the metrics that we should be looking at, and and you know, ultimately in service of like how do I grow my agency, how do I become more profitable, how do I generate more cash flow? There's a lot of ways for us to do that. One of which is for me just a lecture at like here's do this and do this, and it's a little abstracted and in some cases kind of hard to like empathize with. So, 
um, you know, what we decided to do instead is like, well, actually, you know what, why don't we do like, obviously we sit here in our role and we work with hundreds of, you know, a little over a hundred marketing agencies. And we have the benefit of looking at like all of them as a whole. And we can, you know, both from a macro standpoint, like what's going on in the environment, but also like a micro standpoint, like what ultimately sets what, you know, there, here's, here's all these KPIs you should follow. But like, if I step back and just say, well, let me look at the winners. Let me look at the top quartile of performance. What's true about those agencies? What is ultimately driving their outsized performance? And what can I, as an agency who may not find myself in the top quartile, what can I take away from that? So, um, and I, honestly, I'll credit you a little bit, Greg, for the for for like that as a prompt and a direction. I think that's really interesting. So what I've done is, and I'll share my screen now and, and get into it. What, what I've done is I have pulled together the things like the five things that are primarily metrics driven that are true about our top performing agencies. And so what I thought I would do is I would present those five things in the context of a uh, a, a monthly report that we provide. So, you know, we, we use this tool called Fathom. It allows us to take financial information and visualize it and contextualize it. It also allows us to benchmark our clients against others. And and turns out we actually have one client uh, who exemplifies all five of the things I'm about to mention. So what I thought I would do is like let me actually take their their November monthly financial report and use that report to show you this is what the best of the best looks like relative to the important KPIs and trends. So anyway, as you're following along, like this is actually like a real monthly report that we provide. Um, and this is, you know, I obviously sanitized and scrubbed all the identifying info, but anyway, okay. So I'll go through, so, you know, I, I don't want this to be a monologue gray, so I'll go like yep. lesson by lesson. You can stop me, ask questions, dig in, whatever. A couple of these things I think are going to be particularly relevant to what you all do as well. So anyway, with that, you know, let me scroll through. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the executive summary. I just left it here because this is, you know, when we, when we report to a client, we'll, we'll sort of surface these are the key takeaways. This is what matters. And are we on or off track, right? So you can see out, out of the gate that this particular client is crushing all the key metrics that we're tracking for them. And these, of course, are, are custom per, per client. So anyway, with that, <clears throat> let's get into the first thing that is broadly true about all of our clients that are uh, performing in like the top quartile performance. And that is these clients retain revenue to some degree versus rely only on new logos. So like as a foil, and again, we have a lot of these clients and I don't mean to suggest this is a bad thing at all. It just is hard, right? Like the hardest business to run in the agency world is that, uh, you know, I'm a million to $2 million agency. I do branding work, right? I do new logos and, and websites and, you know, sort of like brand identity projects or 50 K and I'm working with like, you know, $5 million small businesses, right? Well, the thing about that is like that $5 million small business can afford exactly one of those projects in per decade, maybe less, right? And so, you know, I sell that 50K and I feel really good and I might earn a really good margin on it, but there's no way I'm going to go back to that well. So I might have a knockout quarter, right? Like a total blow the doors off quarter. And guess what? I wake up the beginning of the next quarter and I got to, I got to put the boulder up the hill again. None of that stacks. I don't get to, I don't get any ability to sort of like stack revenue on itself when I'm in that kind of business where I have no ability to retain revenue. So no question, the winners are those who retain revenue. And, and I know that the natural belief is I have, you know, retaining means I have recurring revenue, right? A monthly recurring service or whatever it is. And obviously that's, at, you know, that's that that's a great model. I don't even mean to say that's preferable. It is a good model if you can have it. It's very naturally retainable. Uh, but it's not the only way, right? Like the other way, of course, is, you know, you have a larger client. I'm My client's Salesforce, right? And now I have the opportunity to string an annuity of projects together, right? Like I might do branding for their event in the summer. And then I might do, uh, you know, some presentation work for, uh, you know, the Salesforce marketing clouds, whatever, right? Like I have different departments, different stakeholders, different ways to like land and expand. And that looks like, that looks like retention. So, um, you know, that, that's like, that's number one. You can see for this particular client, their ability to retain revenue is a key metric for us, right? Because again, that's, that's really important. And they, and they look to see, uh, you know, of their revenue, they look for 70% of that to be what I'd call existing revenue, existing customers. These are logos that we entered the year with, 
um, and they're looking to see, you know, 70%. Now, they, this business does benefit from a traditional retainer model, but you can see that's only 50% of their business. So yeah. 50% is like retainer, 50% is project. And within that project work, they're looking for a meaningful chunk of that to come from existing existing customers. And in this case, that's that's 70-20. Our, our largest client, well into the eight figures of revenue last year, they did 90% of their revenue from existing customers and 10% from new logos. Right. Um, and there's a mix there. There's no perfect answer, but when it's when it's zero one hundred, it's just the world's hardest business model. And I, you know, if you're that, you you you, I'm not telling you anything new. <laughs> you live that every day. Uh, right. But this is this is kind of where you this is where you want to get to. I think it's worth calling out that the um, there are firms who've been able to grow project based, but it's not the norm. Like this is like any best practice. Can we find examples that that don't fit that for sure? Yeah. But the norm is recurring revenue is awesome. Um. The big thing to call out is the less retained revenue you have, the more crucial your pipeline is. So yep. if you see yourself as awesome as a sales operation uh, for your own agency, then like you can get away with a lot more project-based one-off revenue because you'll you'll have that coming in repeatedly enough that it kind of covers the uh, the process. But if you see yourself as like I love the work and I hate having to track down and you know go through the whole sales process you need to be finding your way into a revenue retention model as quickly as possible. Yeah, to totally agreed. And, and, and again, the, the one thing I'll underscore, and you, you know, this of course, but just to clarify, like, I, I think, you know, doesn't, you can still, like, I'm not suggesting you can't do project work. I'm just saying that you, you know, project work for clients that can buy more than one project. I mean, we started with an agency who was, I mean, quite frankly, struggling at the start of the, uh, of last year, um, and the number one tweak that we made to their sales process as a, an experiment was to say like, to, to take your laser beam and focus it on clients that you have worked with in the past, whether you're currently working with, or they've gone stale and, and they did that for the course of like nine months. And we just wrapped up their, their 2023 reporting, especially year they've ever had. And it's because they shifted their, you know, the source of revenue from, exclusively relying on new, which in that, which in a 2023, you know, environment is tough to folks who know them, trust them, you know, believe in what they do, et cetera. So anyway, not to belabor that, that point, but um, so, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll scroll through the other, like I, I left some of these charts in here, just so as you're watching, you can see, like, we're, we're obviously there's, there's other elements of revenue, not necessarily related to the, to the trend that we would show you on a monthly basis, that different ways that we might sort of slice and dice success versus uh target. Um, so anyway, okay. Number two, I have a feeling, uh, Gray, you have a you have a point of view on number two. This this probably is is I'm, you know I'm 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 dipping into your realm here, but um, but the 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 number two trend and and by the way, in no particular order. Quite frankly, if I were to order them, I would probably put this at number one, um, which is uh, the agencies that that are you know in the top quartile they obsess over project margins. Right. And, and so like, you know, the foil again is the agency who you might, you know, we, we have a lot of folks who come to us and, and, and we talk about project margins and they have, you know, they have some sort of like semblance of an idea, right? Like this project went well, I, th you know, it, it felt smooth. I think we did well on that one. This one, you know, didn't go well, it drug on and we had several rounds of revision and we, even to the point where we've concluded we've lost money. But if you're like, all right, well, so, but like, what was your mar what was your project margin on that one? And how did it relate to that one? Um, the agencies who don't do this well give you a blank stare. <laughs> the agencies who do this well are like, oh no, here I'll tell you, I'll tell you exactly. So, um, and and you know, feel free to interject at any point. But just to like what we would look at in it, what a what a client who obsesses over project margins would do is something uh, like this, right? So again, I sanitize this, but this is this particular client's uh, project profitability spreadsheet. And so, you know, again, like the the first thing we're going to do is we're going to ask ourselves. So first of all, we're going to look at all of our in-flight projects and and calculate, like, are we currently on track to make money? Yes or no. Right. And, you know, again, I'm going to I'm going to look at a high level, like, what is my target? So this particular business, I should say, as you're looking at these numbers, is a consultancy 
the margin profile for this like engineering consultancy is different than like a branding agency. So a branding agency might target like 50 to 55% gross margins, 60 plus percent project margins, and like a lower amount of utilization. This business, they target a 40% gross margin with like a 45% project margin because their utilization is like 100%, right? Because they're longer projects and they're more predictable. So anyway, th this... Yeah. You might see these numbers and think, oh, shoot, these are worse than mine. It, this is actually a little bit of a different business. Uh, but anyway, this particular business is targeting, you know, 45% project margin in order to hit their goals. And so the first thing they're going to say is, okay, we're, you know, we've, we've done that in total. Um, but then we're going to look at individual project margins. Like, so Gray, I mean, you, you, I suspect you have a, a similar point of view, but for, for, for our clients who aren't this, right, who are not hitting their project margin, they have a project, you know, they have a gross margin problem, which is a function of the project, mar like what they're doing on projects. And, you know, generally speaking, um, it's not obvious that there's like one clear answer. It's not, it's not usually the case that like, oh, that's uniformly distributed. All of my projects are doing poorly. It's, it, I mean, it can be true, but it's also not usually true that it's like, oh, the, my project margin is bad and they're all bad because like, I just am, I, I just have chosen the wrong price, right? Like my average cost rate is a hundred dollars and I'm just going out there charging 120 and oh shoot, that, that doesn't work mathematically. Like that's not usually how this goes. Usually how this goes is that some of your projects are pretty good and some of your projects are pretty bad. And the reason that some of your projects are pretty bad can be varied, right? They can be, hey, I'm really aggressive when I go price. Like I have this optimistic view of how many hours and turns out that's not how it always works. Or we got a terrible handoff between sales and delivery. Like I had this scope in mind, but I wasn't very clear to them. And so when the client asked for more stuff, they thought, oh, that was included. And I didn't, or it could be project work. And the whole point is to say like, at least in my experience, I think it's difficult to identify those trends in a top-down manner. Like to say, oh, it's clear that we have a handoff problem. More often, those trends are identified in a bottoms-up manner. In other words, I'm going to look at my individual projects and see which ones are not performing. Okay, then I'm going to diagnose. Why is that project not performing? Okay, and then I'm going to solve that particular project. But I'm also going to say, does that rhyme with a problem I have identified on another project recently? And I start to see two dots and three dots and three dots make a line. And now I have identified a theme that I can solve in a more holistic way. Like, oh, our handoff between sales and delivery is, is broken and therefore I need to, to solve it. But my, my point to say of all of that is in our experience, the way you get to that aha, oh, I have a big solution is bottoms up project, brick by brick, project by project. And it looks like a process a lot like this. Does that would you say that conforms to your view of the world, Gray, or how does that compare to what some to what you guys see? Yeah, I think for sure the I think it's totally fine to have strategic reasons to make less money on a project. So I get that. You know, I say like ClickUp's largest global customer came to us for help <clears throat> and wanted a price that was unrealistic for the work. And like it's fine to make a decision about, hey, no, they're the largest customer. They definitely have the money to pay. So we're gonna charge them what we'd normally charge. Or to make a strategic decision and say, um, hey, there's some discount for the volume of work. And because we want to win this specific piece of business to be able to tout whatever. It might be a you know, strategic in terms of referrals they can do. It might be a nonprofit you're trying to help out. There's all kinds of different reasons to do that. But if you're not measuring, it's really hard to know where that's happening totally. accidentally and where that's happening intentionally. And you're you're looking for the bottom, uh, the, the underperformers. And figuring out, like, the easiest way to solve any of this is just charge more. And at some point, the market has a cap on what you're able to charge. And so that's the point where you need to figure out, well, how do we be more efficient? Or is this just the wrong type of client for us to take on, the right type of project? And are there enough of the right types of projects? So yeah, all of that, like, subject area is all tied into project margins, but it all stems out of having visibility into it. So our... Yeah, I ch yeah. go ahead. Um, like, we built the uh, profitability and utilization reporting add-on so that ClickUp users who are using a specific database can get this data in real time without having to do all the legwork to to pull this together, yeah. which is why you get the blank stare all the time because it's like, oh, there's a lot of, like I need to figure out how we recognize revenue and all the different pieces that are tied to this. Yeah. Um, but I think this is 100%. If you're not 
using ClickUp already. If you're not, you know, if, if you don't have this visibility somewhere, like throw it in a sheet and get it built out. This will uncover yep. so much stuff that uh, is causing your ultimate profit to to take a hit. Yeah, totally. And a couple <laughs> a couple things I'll say. First of all, yeah, to- I love that. And and any opportunity, like it, you know, any opportunity, like we have some clients who. Uh, we will do a very manual process for things like uh, utilization and this client included utilization, utilization, uh, forecasting and others, you know, we'll, we'll graduate to the point where we can use a tool like uh, parallax or, or, you know, something like yep. that. Right. So, so, you know, I'm always like, uh, let's solve the process first, right? Let's do this, solve the process first and get the data. And then let's try to find a way to do that more efficiently and automate that. Right. So love that. Uh, I'd be interested to see your tool too, by the way. Um, number two is, yeah, I mean, I I think the 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 biggest thing, like you know, as as I was was uh, listening to you describe some of those things, I think you know the the thing that I just always like the the PTSD I have from sitting in so many of these client meetings is, you know, we we kind of all intuitively know that like I can think of one client in specific, and we have margin problems, and we just kind of intuitively know. It's probably a little of this. It may be a little of this. It could be a little of this. But these are very squirrely problems to solve in the abstract. And there are a lot. And 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 there's, by the way, so the answer is to do it in the specific, right? Like to say, okay, we've like, let's apply that to this specific. Is that exactly what's doing this? Can we solve it here? And then can we use that solution to give us leverage elsewhere? But that's work, right? Like that's a little bit of, you know, what I described as like crawling through glass, which Hey, guess what? That's the jobs we do. That's at the yep. end of the day, like we are, we are selling service and delivering service and how, how well we manage the quality and the efficiency is, is a function of, you know, how much money we make or don't make. Yeah. So. Have you ever done this exercise, Ryan? Have you ever asked um, prospects or clients coming in to just like outline their clients and say, what, who do you like, just rank them by most profitable to least profitable? Cause I've done this a handful of times yeah. and the vast majority of the time, by far the most profitable, by far the least profitable. Like they nail that. Totally. And there's all kinds of discrepancies and total oversight when you get down to anything other than the absolute outliers where they think like this happens almost more commonly than not that there are significant clients who are either under margin or way more profitable than they thought, but they're not close enough to those specific clients uh, yeah. and just have no um, no idea once you actually get in and break it down. <laughs> what it looks like well, the number and- of times that they're surprised around that is kind of astounding to me. Yeah. And, you know, a, an, a, a, a tangible example of that I can think of kind of recently is, you know, clients where obviously a lot of agencies, you know, you'll have you'll have owners that are still involved in the client service to some degree, obviously smaller ones more more frequently than larger ones. Um, but yeah, so the ones that they're doing the service on, they'll have an intimate experience with, and they're probably going like relatively smoothly. And so they'll feel like those are pretty profitable. And some of these where you have some more junior folks, that you 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 may either just don't know or be so abstracted that you assume it's going a little bit worse, but you understate the 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 impact of the cost rate, which is like sometimes you like I see the the total hours, but like the leverage model is just so much different on some of these other projects. Turns out those are more profitable for you, and not just on a dollars basis, but on like a mind share basis, right? It's it's just a more scalable model if I can do more of that and less of this. Yep, for sure. Cool. All right. Um, so I guess the, 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 uh, the only thing to say to kind of wrap a bow on project margins is just like, look, obviously as you're thinking about, like, this is obviously the thing, this is what drives the business and, and, you know, your project margin is, is the revenue you make less the, the cost you spend directly on those projects, right? The utilized time of your team. Right. Then your gross margin is includes both the utilized time of your team and the unutilized time of your team. Right. So project margin is probably the most important driver of gross margin. And so if I do gross margin or if I do project margin well, in all likelihood, I'm going to do gross profit well as as well. So, you know, for this business, we've we've shown their gross profit and they are also performing well against their 40 percent gross profit number. Okay. Um, I bet you have a point of view on this one too, Greg. I, I suspect you you all fun get involved one. here pretty pretty uh, pretty meaningfully. Um, so number three, uh, the best in, the best agencies hire with data, not optimism. Uh, and sort of sub sub note, uh, they build flexibility into their staffing model. And so uh, again, I, I always like to start with the counter, right? So the counter to this would be, and I see you know I have these conversations all the time, which is like. Um, two two versions of it. One is like, all right, I get it. My utilization is is poor. Uh, I've got you know I have too many people, um, but 
we got a lot of things cooking. Like my pipeline is feeling good, right? Like I, I, I couldn't possibly part with these individuals because like, I'm feeling some mo, right? And I got some momentum or even worse, like, hey, I'm entering the year and uh, we got big plans and I need X, Y, and Z expertise so that I can go sell it. And so I, I got to like front load with the talent, right? That's, that's, the, that's the more destructive version of it. But, but, but even on the prior, like the, I'm feeling really good. Well, here's the problem. Like the, the problem with that and is like, hey, guess what? If you're, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're an agency owner, you're listening to this, like you are an optimist by definition. Like, because you, I mean, you know, if you weren't an optimist, if you were a pessimist, you would not do this job. <laughs> you would optimize for net present value of cash and you'd probably go work for somebody else. But because you're an optimist, you see the opportunity of being in the top quartile and you believe you're there and most of you are right. Uh, but because you are an optimist, you see everything through the, 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 the most rosy lens. And while that's a great, that is such a well, that is such a great skill. Don't let that strength be your undoing. <laughs> and in and in making tactical, specifically staffing decisions with that same lens, incredibly destructive, right? So the ones that do this well are using real data, right? Which is to say, all right, I have this team that is, you know, I have this team and I have this amount of booked revenue, right? Whether it's projects that are booked and are coming or recurring revenue, whatever it is, I have this amount of booked revenue, right? And then I, which, which may use some all too much of my current team. And then I also have a pipeline, right? Like I also have opportunities that are in my pipeline and I have applied, and this is hard, but I have applied some degree of objective weighting to those pipeline, right? Like I am, I'm saying, okay, these are these opportunities, but if I use history or I use some other form of objective weighting, if I, I have sort of an overall best guess expectation of what my next 30, 60, and 90 days are going to look like from a demand standpoint, and I'm going to use that data to make hiring decisions. And if that data, despite all this good vibes that I'm getting in the sales call, if those are all top of funnel and if I do my waiting, it don't amount to anything, then you know what? Hanging on to that person just because I've, I've got good feels, it's poor, it's poor choice, right? Similarly, if if the data suggests that, you know what, this, this, is, this revenue is gonna stack and I'm understaffed, you know what? It takes 90 days to go hire a W-2 employee. I need to get on it right now. And the best agencies understand that math and are and are collecting that information and are making their decisions that way. Like this one, right? Where you see, and I'm only, I've only gone out 30 days for a couple of reasons, but you can see like this here is my capacity. I've hired some folks going into December and my booked and weighted are actually the same. So you, the yellow is below the red. I've got excess capacity, right? So I just hired somebody, I probably wouldn't let them immediately go, but I certainly have the capacity to sell into, and I'm expecting a little excess capacity, lower utilization going into that month. So anyway, that's the, that's the, that's the exercise that, that I assume that probably comports with a lot of what, what you're recommending for your, your teams, Greg. Yeah. I think the, like the two things I'd tag onto that one is you say that today and that resonates at a totally different level with everybody uh, who's here on the call. Versus if you said that 18 months ago, because 18 months ago we were going through, you know, the best bull run for agencies in the last ever, you know, two decades. Yeah. Probably, yeah. probably pretty much ever coming like the, yeah. the tail end of 21 or of yeah. 20 COVID a bump. lot of free money. 21 was awesome. 22, the first half was awesome. And then oh, things started to slow down a little bit. And so if we told everybody that, uh, you know, Q2 of 2022, everyone's like, yeah, but that's not what my data says. Like my data says we just keep growing forever. And now yeah. everyone's lived through this for the last year and said, oh, shoot, we're fat. Like we've got to yeah. cut yeah. back. Um, there's just a lot of experience where this is going to resonate more. Yeah. Um, and I think the, I mean, like figuring out what you're, we'll probably talk more at some point here about utilization uh, compared to what your profit margin or your, you know, the, the gap between your average bill yeah. rate and average labor rate or whatever language we want to use around that um, looks like. So I think that's certainly part of what your utilization target should be. Um, but there's all the, like what, what you said is hundred percent true. You know, our greatest strength of being optimists is the reason we're in this business is the greatest weakness and the the reason that we wind up uh, falling down yeah. here over hiring and not wanting to, to cut back at all. Yeah. Well, and by the way, we can talk. <clears throat> we can touch on. So let me say. Let me say a couple things. I'll, let me touch on the, the the thread that you just you pulled for a second, yep. which is the uh, the sort of like target utilization rate. And and you know this is how we are are viewing this. And and Gray, feel free to disagree, agree, edit, whatever. Um, but you know, again, generally, uh, you know, our our 
target gross margin. So I, I had this like, I, this may not, this may resonate, it may not resonate. <laughs> I'll just show it because I'm going to talk about it, Wait. which is like, again, the, the, what, what I would call like the margin waterfall, right? So like if I'm an agency and I'm targeting a 50% gross margin, that is a combination of how much money I'm making on my projects, right? Which is the, t you, you know, the, the revenue less the cost of the time my people are spending on projects and, uh, and my unutilized service wages, right? Which is the time my people are not spending on projects, right? So my 50% gross margin assumes a target project margin and a target utilization or a target underutilization, if you will, right? And so, you know, again, like the, the, uh, th this particular business, if I go back over here, their math is a 45% project margin target uh, with a 90% utilization rate. So you can see that they were at 94, a 90%, because again, these are very large, long-term, very predictable. That is very atypical for a more traditional agency that might be in like the 65, 70% blended target utilization. But anyways, they're 90. Um, and, and in order, if they hit 90 and 45, then their gross margin will be 40 or roughly 40, right? That's the idea. And so generally what in this exercise, the, should I hire, should I not, we have sort of like a, a collar, right? Like a utilization collar. In other words, okay. I mean, this collar is a little bit narrower because of the predictability of this business, but you know, let's just use round numbers. Like my collar might be, and, and by the way, this is often a little custom for specific roles if you can get to that point. But anyway, let's just say my collar is like my target is 65, right? As a blended business in order to hit my 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 goals at let's say 75, uh, I'm I'm redlining. Like my team is doing too much and I'm not flexible enough to take on new work or to do uh, the oversight that is required. 75 would be the point where it's like this is this is redlining or, and, and 72 is like, this is the point we got to hire, right? We're approaching redlining to the point where it's time to fire up the sales engine because by the time I get somebody in here, I'll be at 75 or above. And on the flip side, you know, my, my, the bottom of my utilization might be 60 or, you know, the numbers don't matter. But the point is I have a, I have a, a low end, which is, Hey, I, I, I'm not hitting my target, but I'm not hitting my target by so much that I have excess slack that is going to meaningfully deteriorate profitability, I'm going to have to let some air out of the the staffing model and we're going to have to let go or reduce or whatever that looks like. Yeah. How does that compare to how you guys? I think I think it's exactly right. I think the like if we could dig into the psychology of this for a second too. Yeah. There is a lot of, I don't want to let this person go. They're a key member of the team. They've been great. They've done nothing wrong. We just lost clients because the economy has been tough. And so, I, you know, and also I don't want to scare off other people on the team that we're letting someone that everyone likes go. And so we hold on to people for longer than we ought to. And what happens is we just all as humans adapt to the new normal. So we're underutilized. We're sitting at 50% or 45%, a number that's definitely not sustainable for the business, but we think we're doing everybody a favor by keeping them on. And everyone gets used to that. And now you finally do turn things around and people are like, whoa, 70% utilized. Like this is crazy compared to what I had before. The workload is just through the roof. You, you know, it's hire. like, wait, wait, we're barely touching where we need to be. And I've got all this catch up to do. Yeah. Like I'm not happy. And now you're losing some of your best people anyways. Um, and so I, you're not doing anyone a favor by staying yeah. um, too fat staffed for too long. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, there's so many, you know, like it's, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And also, like, look, if you're staying too fat for too long, you are losing money. I mean, it, it, you know, like uh, uh, the, this, this, um, the thing I say a lot internally is that, like, you, you always read these stats, like a, a substantial amount of households, U.S. households live paycheck to paycheck. Well, right. a similar percentage of businesses live payroll to payroll. Yep. And and part of the reason is because of this, right? It's 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 hanging on to folks. Well, eventually, a stiff breeze is going to knock you over. And you just ask yourself, like, am I, do I want to save this one person at the risk of all of these people? I mean, through that, through that lens, is this, is this really doing anybody any favors? Pro probably not. Yeah. Um, th the only other thing I'll add to this is, and this is not a, uh, this is not a, a solution to that problem, uh, but it is a mitigant to that problem, which is a lot of the, a lot of the agencies who have figured this out, uh, mitigate this risk to some degree by building some flex into their staffing model. So some percentage right. 
of their way of their services are being done by freelancers. And it's just an escape valve, right? So you obviously look, we're matching supply and demand. Most of these are project based, right? Even if they're annuities, annuities of projects are still project based. So like your revenue does not go like up and to the right. It's up and down. It's ebbs and flows. It's like, so, you, you know, you, 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 you are, you are going to have to try to match supply and demand as best you can. And freelancers allow you to let the, the escape valve out a little bit or flex up, right? If you get a big project and you, you're at risk of saying no. So, um, you know, the, 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 the right amount of freelancers relative to, uh, you know, W2s does not have a firm answer. It could, it could be zero if it's, you know, in certain cases, but that is a, that is a, a tool, but of course, keep in mind that, you know, what you, what you get in flexibility, you give up in your average cost rate, right? Naturally freelancers are, are more expensive on a per hourly basis. And so this is you choosing to, to inflate to some degree, your average, you know, average hourly cost rate for the sake of having this flexibility and striking that balance is very like client, you know, very business, business model dependent. Yep. There's some great questions around that specific topic, but we'll get to that in the Q and I want to let you, I'll get out of the way and let you keep going here to, to number okay, four. Okay, cool. Well, you know, the good news is the last couple are a little quicker and straightforward. So, um, uh, so then, yeah, let's do that. Let's get, let's knock these out and let's get into the Q and A. Okay, cool. Number four, um, you know, this is this is actually a really good segue from what we were just talking about, uh, which is the sort of natural peaks and valleys of of demand in a project business. Uh, the best agencies are holding on to cash, right? These are agencies who have who have stockpiled sufficient cash reserves so that, you know, if I have no cash reserves, then I'm riding that, I'm riding that wave up and down. I'm I'm laying off immediately and I'm hiring immediately. And because I, you know, I, I have no ability to pay for people if I don't have money coming in. Obviously, that's no way to live. And so, you know, we, we recommend, you know, roughly three months of fixed operating expenses sitting in cash reserves. If you're a recurring revenue business, uh, you can you can sustain a number less than that, probably two, maybe even a little less than two. Uh, and if you are a, uh, you know, a, a, a long sales cycle, highly unpredictable hits business, <laughs> then you probably need to stack maybe four, uh, four plus uh, in, in cash. So, you know, th this is an example of obviously a client who has done a wonderful job at that. And, and even, I mean, look, there's no, there's no like too much. I mean, some of this is like a personal decision, but I can tell you the way we, we typically advise clients is, you know, get to the point where you have your cash reserves and, you know, this is probably a S corp or a flow through business, just distribute the rest, right? Like put, take, take the money off the table and put it in your own investment vehicle or do whatever you want with it. That's one of the benefits. These don't have, these don't sell for high multiples. They're not software companies. They generate a lot of cash if you do them well. So take it off the table and enjoy that. Um, so, you know, this, this, this would be an opportunity for somebody to do that if they, if they so chose. Uh, but the, 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 the two ways to do this better, one of which you'll see this client does quite well, which is they collect AR like it's their job because it is their job. <laughs> and so like 20 days, 21 days of like average, like I submit it to, I get a, a cash check in the mail. That is top of the class. That is a plus really good job, especially if, if you're working with like, you know, that, that may not even be achievable depending on if you have enterprise level clients. Um, you know, at my agency, I think 120 days was what PNG was paying. So like, you know, that, that's pretty tricky. The other thing that agencies do relatively well, th th um, that this, this client, I don't actually think is taking advantage of this, but is, um, using customer funds to fund your operation rather than debt or something else. And you do that through deferred revenue. You do that through like billing up front and collecting up front. Like as an extreme example, which again is there were reasons why we were able to do this, but at, at my agency, you know, we we were an influencer marketing agency and generally we would we would um, invoice the second the uh, IO was signed for 100% of the project. That would be due in 30 days. And in a lot of cases, it would be due before we would even kick off the project. Like we would have all of the money to pay for the work before we did any of the work. Yep. And and again, there's that's that's doable to varying degrees, but that made it super easy. And we had like a little AR uh, line of credit. We would we were able to turn that into a cash in one day. And so uh, we had far more cash uh, in our bank than you know the revenue we were recognizing because we were growing and we were pulling cash forward. If you can do that then you can grow and uh, invest a lot faster. Anyway, so that's the cash piece. And the fifth and final is, and this is to some degree a bit unsatisfying for folks who are unable to take advantage of this because there's not a lot you can do about this, but the most successful clients of ours are big enough to enjoy what's called operating leverage, right? And so basically what that means is like, look, 
if I'm a 500, there are things that I need as an agency that I have to have and pay for that are, that's true, whether I'm a half million dollar agency or a $5 million agency, right? These are just fixed monthly operating expenses. And by the way, when I buy them at a half million dollar agency, those costs do not 10 X by the time I become a $5 million agency, they might 2x, they might grow 50%. I mean, you know, generally, like they're, they're not going to grow. The, the idea is as your revenue grows like this, your up your overhead grows like this, right? And so just naturally, you don't have to do anything else better. Your your gross margins don't have to get better, project margins don't have to get better. As long as revenue grows, your profit margin will improve because the overhead is going to decline as a percentage of revenue because it's just not going to grow as fast. And if it is growing as fast, you're spending too much. <laughs> don't do that. That's not the way to run this business, right? Get the get the benefit of operating leverage. This particular client is in like the $3 million a year range. And so they're honestly just on the front end of enjoying this. They keep doing a lot of this stuff. This 13%, which by the way, is incredibly efficient uh, as a lot of these consultancies are. Uh, this thing's going to go now, uh, south of 10. Uh, and that 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 four percentage just gets directly added to the 16%, right? So that 16 and a half percent operating profit becomes a, let's round up for fun, a 21% operating profit margin just for free, right? You don't have to cut budget. You just keep doing what you're doing and you're growing revenue and you just become more profitable. And that, like I said, the, 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 I guess the counter to that is if you're a million dollar agency and you're doing a bunch of project work, a 20% operating margin is hard to achieve because you don't have operating leverage, right? And so some of your ability to be profitable and pay yourself more money and all those sorts of things, some of that is just a revenue problem. It's just a revenue opportunity. It's just a, you got to get bigger. And that's just a, that's just a reality of how these businesses work. Any business works. Yeah. That's awesome. I want to pull Kuba back in here to walk to the next steps. The one thing I, I um, like project margins, back to your earlier point, are such a big yeah. piece compared to operating leverage. Is where I see teams um, pick up operating leverage but not improve um, operating margin. It's almost always because they are, you know, they're scaling there. Uh, everyone's getting raises internally. We're growing. That's great. Everyone's earning more money, and they're not adjusting pricing at the same time. Yeah. So that that project margin piece uh, get out or get, get behind basically of, of the extra skill that they're doing. So operating leverage is an awesome concept and you just need to make sure that all this stuff works together. So Ryan, I thought that totally. was yeah, like, we get, we could spend another hour and a half just on those metrics, <laughs> but super cool to see like, Hey, here's <laughs> what an actual agency looks like. Here's yeah. the types of reports. And I think that bleeds super well into Kuba pulling you back up. Like I'll give a shout out to what you guys are doing. And it's, I'm, you know, I'm sure this question will pop in at some point and you probably answered a lot, but like what tool is that you mentioning that that's fathom right out of the gate? Um, where does that data pull from? Like, how can we get that is I'm sure a recurring question. So yeah, Kuba, cool. I'll let you, I'll let you interject here, but maybe we can go back to some of that stuff during Q and A. All right. Well, thank you. First of all, for the awesome presentation, this is a little bit of an intermission between the main content and the Q and A, which yep. we'll get into in just a second, but some of you might be thinking, how do I learn more from Ryan? How do I leverage upsourced expertise? And a couple of words about Zenpilot before we move on. So first of all, for upsourced, uh, definitely check out their site and go to the contact us page on the site to start working uh, with Ryan and his team. Uh, Caroline from upsource is going to drop the links in the chat in just a second to make things convenient for you. There you go. Upsourcedaccounting.com slash contact us. And the second thing I want to tell you about is one of my favorite YouTube channels, and that's the Upsource the YouTube channel. They're dropping just a lot of good stuff there, running a podcast, which I recently had a chance to be a guest on, so you can check that out as well. And if you want to see the first iteration of this webinar series, it's also on the Upsource channel. So go to YouTube uh, at Upsource, and you'll find that channel there. For my part, sorry, our part, I should say, I have a very brief screen share for you. Uh, let me just pull that up. Okay, are you seeing the screen? Yes. Got it. Okay, so two words about Zenpilot. We're ClickUp's largest and highest rated solutions partner. We can help you build a watertight project management, work management system based on ClickUp and based on teamwork.com, actually. You can learn all about that on zenpilot.com. Basically, we help you fix project management chaos and lead you through the last project management implementation you'll ever need. Uh, because you'll be running the Zen pilot system. Uh, I, 
wanted to pull this up just for a second here. These are Zenpilot profitability reports, something that's really relevant to the topic of this conversation. Like where we can get you at Zenpilot is we can give you this uh, full view of uh, your profitability uh, per project, per client, all based on your ClickUp data. So if you're interested in that, uh, you should check out again Zenpilot.com under our uh, solutions dropdown. There's a little bit of uh, yeah gray just dropped that in, in the chat so go to the link that gray just dropped and you can learn more about that as well we've got a live stream recording about that as well uh on our youtube channel so go check that out next up we've got something for you all ah, right uh you know what in the interest of time if you want to learn about the three keys you'll have to check that out on our site as well but free stuff We've got the ClickUp bundle for you uh, today, which includes our ClickUp for Agencies guide, a full client onboarding process template built in ClickUp, and our client journey template. So if you want to get a taste of what the Zenpilot system is like for project management and for fixing your, your agency operations, go to zenpilot.com slash ClickUp dash bundle. It's on the screen there, and it'll be in the chat in a second. I think <laughs> Gray's assisting me here, isn't he? <laughs> yes, thank you, Gray. Uh, so much for dropping that in the chat, and that's where you can uh, have a taste of the system, run some of this yourself. And of course, uh, when you're ready, you can go to zenpilot.com slash call, meet the team, get your blueprint, which is what we call the kind of diagnosis of your project management, a full plan for how you should set up your project management uh, and a recommendation of whether you should be building on ClickUp or teamwork.com. Uh, in there, I'll let you look at our testimonials for 15 seconds here, and we'll get right into the Q&A. Actually, I'll leave that pulled up for just a second. We've got seven questions in the Q&A that I can see. Uh, Ryan Gray, did you have any preference as to which one? Is there one that you're looking at and you're just itching to answer, or do we go chronologically? Anything else that you might want here? I don't have any strong point. opinions. Whatever you think, okay. Gray. Ryan, let me throw stuff at you. Yeah. Andrew asks, can we assume existing non-recurring is from upsell? This is back to um, basically recurring yeah. revenue versus reoccurring revenue. Not necessarily. Revenue. I mean, again, in these cases, it's not upsell. This is like, you know, the example would be Salesforce. I did a project for Salesforce last year. I did another project for Salesforce this year, right? It's a different thing. Might be the same buyer, might be a different buyer in the same company. The point is I didn't have to go get a new MSA. I didn't have to go break into Salesforce. I landed and I expanded. Uh, and that's usually what this existing non-recurring looks like. Yep. I would say that's more commonly uh, where I see yep. that as well. All right. Uh, Michael jumped in with a couple of good questions. Is that cool. chart a recommendation for FTEs versus freelance nine to one? Is that overall by role? And you kind of hinted at this earlier, like, hey, there's not necessarily a magic. Yeah. Say a couple yeah, that's all. That. Yeah, that's all I would say. It's not necessarily reco. I mean, that to answer your question, that is in this case, it's like my my total service wages or service costs are ninety percent W two, ten percent freelance. Uh, but that is not what I'm putting forth as a recommendation. Somebody here actually in the chat has a eighty twenty model, which we can talk about that question. But uh, and and I think in certain situations that's great too. By the way, I have clients who are a hundred freelance, and you know that, and that's. That can work, right? It's it's you know so there's no answer, but the um, yeah anyway yeah no 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 specific answer. Yep, uh, this might be a translation of that question, but what percent would you recommend seeing freelancers at before you hire in house? Like we're talking about, like, well, anyway, I'll I'll let you take the first step of that one. Yeah. So, um, well, again, I don't have a specific answer of like what percent I would look at. I, I think the, the generally speaking as an agency is going from zero to one, right? You're, you're often starting with heavy freelancers because you don't have a choice. Like you cannot afford the, especially for a multidisciplinary offering, right? Like I need design and development and strategy and copy and whatever. Like I can't hire four people when I don't have enough revenue. And so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to use freelance talent, um, and so, you know, this is an unsatisfying answer, but unfortunately, a lot of these are, are more nuanced than they are like formulaic, but it's the point where the, the, like at zero, my, tr the, like at zero, 
I, I need, I, I require flexibility. I cannot afford to pay for somebody full time, right? So flexibility is my number one thing. At some point, reducing my cost per hour so that I can earn a profit is more important than my exclusive flexibility, right? And so again, that that is the point where, okay, I have enough work and enough comfort that I can achieve a minimum utilization rate for that individual such that it's worth it for me to hire them and I'm gonna do that in lieu of, of, of a freelancer. So anyway, that that's the the way of thinking about it, but the percentages or the thresholds may differ based on- yeah, past. I think if you had to, if you pinned me down to say like because your answer is the right answer, but that doesn't get retweeted or reshared because that takes four <laughs> paragraphs to explain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you know, I think it breaks into a couple different buckets. How bullish are, are you on more demand for the same thing happening? And if you're super bullish, then I, I'd pick a ratio here and maybe say like, hey, when you're paying fifty percent of what you think an FTE would be to a freelancer. And that could be because they'd be the exact same hourly rate and you're using half their time. You know, they're spending 20 hours a week on it, or it could be because they're double the rate, but they're spending right. 10 hours 10 a week hours. on it or whatever. Yeah. You know, if it's in that, Hey, I know more of this work's coming, like go ahead and go make the hire. If you've got the cash to do it. Um, yeah. If it's more experimental, I don't know if we're going to do the service or not, like get that ratio an awful lot closer to a hundred or even over a hundred. Uh, you know, I know yeah. I can save money well, today if I plug in somebody full time, but if you're not sure how much demand you're going to have, or you're not very optimistic about that, you know, you may still want to be uh, paying too much, you know, theoretically to a freelancer. Yeah, I think that's right. And look, it goes back to the same. I mean, you know, it's it's the same question of like, do I hire or do I not? Right. You have that utilization collar. So you describe in your example, you're talking about like a 50 percent. You like, do I have 50 percent utilization yep. on this individual and this 50 percent work in my business? If so, let's right. do it. And yeah, if 50 percent doesn't work in my business, then I can, you know, I can't do it. Right. So it's the same kind of framework. Yep. I think, Andrew, if there's anything else you want answered, you asked again about how much the subcontract model plays into it. And that's the 80 20 mix that you mentioned, Ryan. Yeah. Um, clarify if there's anything else that we didn't cover there. Michael had another good one. Are you considering utilized wages as part of your COGS and your AGI, or is it part of OPEX? Yeah, no, it's definitely in COGS, right? Like, let me just be, let me just be very uh, cl clear on, on how this breaks down. So like my AGI in my little margin thing was, was, is revenue effectively. So you have gross revenue, you have gross revenue, and then you have freelance out of pocket costs, right? Subtract those things out. Now I have AGI. So AGI is like real revenue, right? Okay. Yeah. So I have my real revenue. And then my, this is, this is how we view the world. My service wages, utilized or unutilized are cost of goods sold, right? These are cost of goods sold, whether they're doing work or not, right? Whether they're doing, if they're doing work, they fall into my project margin. If they're not doing work, then they don't. But they're all of my utilized or all of my wages are in COGS. And my gross margin, of course, is a function of, or my gross profit is my AGI less my uh, my service wages, right? Yep. But but service wages are in COGS and then SGNA wages, my salespeople, my marketing people, my HR people, they are in OPEX. Cool. Um, we got a couple other good ones here. Thanks, Andrea. Um, let's go to this top one. Uh, we might have already mentioned, like, I think we might have covered this a little bit in the contractor FTE. What does that look like? But um, Anshu will ask how to solve the demand and the supply. Yeah. Like, which one comes first? What's the chicken and the egg here? Record uh, and supply resources we have and new train resources. Uh, yeah. Well, to be honest, I might be talking about demand and supply a little bit differently. I would, but, but let me let me try to parse the semantics, I guess. Which is like, do so. The question is, and you tell me, Gray, if this sounds right to you. The question yeah. is, do I solve? Uh, Resource new resources I need to go get versus resources I have, uh, but I need to train and uh, make useful for what I have. Like, how, how do you view that question? Yeah, I, I just want to make sure I'm answering the right and question. I, skip, I skipped over the parentheses part, thinking, oh, it's normal is demand and supply, but you're right. Rereading it, I don't think it's normal demand and supply. And normal demand and supply, one thing I'd, I'd throw in there yeah. if you got normal, like chicken and egg, I don't know if I'm going to sell enough, you know, we're in that in between state. Uh, yeah. There's all kinds of mechanisms you can use to be able to create demand first and buy yourself time windows to generate the supply that needs to come with it. So yeah. the common example is like foot in the door offer in the Zen pilot case, like the blueprint that we do, we're going to spend the first two weeks building out this uh, basically playbook of what needs to happen for you. What does ClickUp need to look like? All the, you know, all the other things that need to get fixed here um, by going right into that, that gives us some flex on the back end 
to say, hey, now, like, you wanted to get started solving the problem today. We got started solving the problem today. Most of the time, we can go directly out of that into the project. But if we are significantly over capacity, we can buy ourselves or stagger things and say, yeah. hey, let's, you know, let's uh, start on this in two weeks or whatever. And clients are going to be way more, like, that's just a simple example from ZenPilot, but clients will be way more accepting of that kind of time delay once there's already been progress made and there's stuff that they can go work on in that interim. Um, so anyways, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunities there. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I think that's right. And I guess the only other thing, if I were viewing demand, which is like people need my services and supply, meaning I have people that do services, um, like in general, I, I would, uh, it's the same hiring example, right? Like I'd look at what I have and what my sort of objective weighted pipeline is. And if I'm overstaffed, then I have to solve the supply first, right? Yep. Regard, like, obviously I have to go get demand regardless, right? Like you can't solve one or the other, but if I have too much supply for what I have and think I will get, I have to solve the supply now full stop. And then I can go work on demand. And the best problem to have in the world is I have to go higher again. What a wonderful that thing that would be. Uh, you know, if, if, if that's the sequence of events. So, yep. All right. Cool. Two others. I'm gonna give you the easy one first, which is what other tools or platforms do you recommend for traffic, tracking profit and margins based on projects and retainers <laughs> and the ability to track? So, you, well, I mean, you gave. Oh, go I ahead. think maybe, uh, click up and Zen pilot has to be part of, uh, what I would suggest, right. Cause you, 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 you guys do this really, <laughs> you do this really well. You have a good thing. I mean, my answer to this question, <clears throat> I love giving the right answer, not the satisfying answer, but my, my, my overall recommendation is like wrong question to ask, uh, it, which is to say like what I want to do is create the process, right? Ultimately, the you know you saw that what we are using is like Google Sheets, right? And to be honest with you, almost eight problems out of ten I'm going to use Google Sheets because I can get up and going really fast. I can make it do exactly what I want. And the thing that's harder is like how do I get the revenue data? How do I get the hours data? How do I get all the other out of pocket stuff? Yeah. What, what I what I will say is like we, you know we. If you if you are going to do this stuff, there's 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 lots of tools out there, right? Like we we love we like Harvest. Harvest is like a good time tracking tool. Uh, it also allows us to do some like capacity planning. It also allows us to do a little bit of uh, of profitability. So having like a good but but my you know and and then obviously we use like uh you know you, you have a good GL, so we use all the QuickBooks or Zero for us to actually do the rev rec, right? These are the you know those are those are the primary a couple of the primary inputs. Uh, but there's a lot of other things. So anyway, I mean, I would almost defer to Greg. Greg, like, wh what do you think? Because we often are focused on process and our tools are dual sheets. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think that I differ from that. Like all of our, so like huge transition point for us was bringing on an outsourced, like fractional accounting CFO um, firm. And it shocked me at first how much wound up back in Google Sheets. So I think- to the point of yep. like, don't don't overcomplicate it. Make sure the like the core data is right. Um, makes sense. I think a lot of this is just like the starting point for all of this because we could be you know we could do a whole another hour just on this. The starting point for all of this is figure out what that scorecard is. What are the metrics? And that's what I yep. wanted to get today. Is like not everybody on this call is going to go hire you guys and have a fancy Fathom report and Google Sheets for all this stuff. That not everyone's in this situation. Hopefully, some folks are in the situation where that should be the outcome. Um. But seeing the scorecard, what metrics do we need to have? Like you can figure out a way once you're clear on what you need. And too yeah. often, because it's not our core area of expertise, it's like, I don't know, there's 57 different financial metrics. I read this blog post and said I should measure it. Like, I'm just not going to do any of those because 57 yeah, weeks. Right, exactly. So a couple core things is like, that's the process <laughs> pieces. What do we actually need to find? And we can go figure like the, how to get that is way easier. Shoestring and bubble gum to start and like build the, yep. build the habit and then, and then look to optimize, automate make yep. it more efficient over time. Yeah. And talk to one of us, talk to upsource or talk to us and we'll help you get to what that scorecard should look like. Yep. All right. Uh, Antrol said, you guys are awesome. So that's the compliment, but not the question. The earlier question was <laughs> how to remove the personal relationship with founders from client billing and scope. Um, Start founders often ask for a lot of favors, long credits do assigning projects without mandates. Don't know what that means. And we've always lost money because of that. So I think there's an easy answer and a slightly harder answer here, but any immediate thoughts? Uh, <laughs> well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what your easy answer is, uh, but my uh, easy answer is, uh, not, not to do these things. Um, and think, my answer uh, is the Nike slogan, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Just do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, this is, we know what to do. Like you're, you're a service provider, right? Like the, the, the phrase I love for entrepreneurship is, um, good friends pay full price, right? Yep. Like, and, and so 
you know, don't let these people take advantage of you just because you know each other. It's full stop. This is all about identity too. Like, do you see yourself as a serious yeah. business owner or do you not? If you yeah. see yourself as a serious business owner and you may have to, you know, for, assume that identity for a little while, well, it doesn't feel true. Then like yep. be a serious business owner and, and don't tolerate yep. stuff that you shouldn't tolerate. Agreed. Uh oh, Kuba's back in. Alarm clock. We're out of time. <laughs> How did this happen? We so just started. <laughs> agenda police here ends up that's right yeah. we're over time uh but this was great cool. and we finished the q a right on time so i think we're good to actually go here uh many many thank yous uh thank you to everyone who attended this has been great you'll get a follow-up via email with some of the links that we shared and some other extra stuff so look to your email inboxes for that thank you so so much ryan for Sharing, Thanks for having you know, us here and giving us a killer presentation. I want to shout out Caroline Round, who's in the background here in, in the chat and, you know, worked hand in hand uh, with us here to make this webinar happen. And last but definitely not least, thank you, Gray. Uh, I, I, I honestly love seeing the back and forth between the two of you. This has been such a natural conversation. Great to follow. I learned a lot myself as well, as I'm sure the attendees did as well. We're going to be finishing up here. Everybody have a nice day or afternoon or whatever time it is uh, where you are. And yeah, I'm done talking. Anything <laughs> else from anybody else or shall I click the button? <laughs> That's nope. great. Thanks, Let's Ryan. Adjourn. Thanks all. Yeah, all right. Thanks, thanks everyone. Bye-bye.